What's up, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of the Agents to Owners podcast. This week, I am stoked to talk talk about one of the hottest topics in the entire insurance industry, which is virtual assistants, virtual professionals. Pick your poison. And today, I have Troy Thompson, president of Savital Virtual Assistants and uh, equity partner in Savital, David Carruthers, also president of Florida Risk Partners, Killing Commercial, uh, Power Producers Podcast. We could go on and on. <laughs> Fellas, thank you for joining me today. I'm um, really looking forward to getting into this. I would tell you the list of stuff that I have my fingers in is represented of my ADHD more than my qualifications. <laughs> so just keep that in mind as we get through this. David, right. uh, traffic control pilot. <laughs> as you guys know, I mean, virtually every day online, uh, there is somebody bringing up virtual assistants. What are you guys using them for? What company do you use? So I'm super excited to uh, discuss this topic today. Um, Troy, in your in your words, what would you say are the the biggest benefits of using a VP service? Right now, with the hardening market, how busy every insurance agency is in 2023. It, it's the craziest time in pretty much everybody's history of insurance, I would say, with remarketing, phone calls, clients, you know, calling up and using virtual professionals to not only do the quoting or, or the requoting of those clients to set up the whole renewal process um, is a big benefit on top of things, things as simple as answering phone calls, taking that work, work off the local team's plate. I'm in here today and we are just slammed and we have plenty of VPs, plenty of people, but a couple of our employees went on vacation this week. And so just having that extra support, especially in this market that we're in is critical. Yeah. I, I'm going to add to that. I think that um, a couple of things, number one, I didn't even know <clears throat> there was such a thing as virtual assistants or virtual professionals until probably three years ago when I first three or four years ago when I first got added to IAOA never heard of the group didn't even know it existed I'm over here in my own island in Florida trying to launch my agency by myself and I get in there and it's like drinking from a fire hose because I see all these things everybody else is doing and immediately I'm thinking man I'm missing the boat I, I should be doing this I should be doing this and then I immediately rein myself back in <clears throat> but you know Every time that I hear people talk about virtual assistants, virtual professionals, the majority of the time is talking about one or two things. You know, it's either, hey, you can save money on your labor cost or you can get your own time back because these people are going to take things off your desk. But I want to focus on a third thing that I don't think very many people talk about. And it's something that Savatel certainly hangs its hat on. And it's a message that everybody needs to hear. But I also want to talk about the quality of the people. I think that by and large, when you hear people start talking about VAs, whether it be intentional or subconsciously, they don't always hold those people in the same regard as they do their normal team. Okay, let's just call it what it is. Um, not throwing stones at anybody. If that's you and you get offended, maybe look in the mirror, maybe look at a couple of posts and see where you did that. And you'll understand why I say that. But <clears throat> I've been very clear with Troy in the leadership of Savital over in Pakistan we really need to get the messaging out about the quality of the people that we have because they're highly educated individuals. They can do nearly anything at all that needs to be done. And not very many other people in this space focus on the actual people. And that's really what drives it, right? So you're talking to somebody who three or four years ago had never even heard of using virtual professionals in their agency to somebody who now has six in their agency mm -hmm. And it's highly likely that I will be at a dozen or more by the end of this year because we're taking the approach that we want anything that's non-revenue bearing that can be done by outsourcing to be taken care of by a virtual professional because my team needs to focus on heavy lifting customer service issues. Yes, we have them and we need to deal with those things domestically in real time immediately and revenue bearing activity. My producers will do nothing but focus on closing deals at this point. And the variety of tasks that we have our virtual professionals doing 
is remarkable. We have a virtual professional that sets all of our appointments for our producers. We have two virtual professionals that do nothing but video editing and marketing editing for graphics for us. And then we have three that we're training right now to be absolutely deadly CSR level or account manager level people. And it's primarily because of a, their ability and desire to learn and please, because these people want to, they want your affirmation. They're doing a good job and they, they're like sponges. They soak up every single thing that you send to them. And so that's part of it. But also the other part of it is we're investing in them, man. Like I'm treating them no differently than anybody else that would come into my agency. I'm, I'm in the process of procuring two, Uh, desktop engineering rigs so that my video editors in Pakistan have the exact same equipment that my team here does so that when we need to teach them something or troubleshoot, they're operating on the exact same systems. You know, when we deal with the CSRs and the account managers, I hired a Hawksoft consultant, Peggy Corbett, absolutely fantastic money in the bank. She is whipping my big rear end into shape in a heartbeat, but she's coming in and she's putting standard operating procedures and workflows in on how we need to operate inside the agency management system, formalizing those processes and also training those virtual professionals in all of those things as she goes. So the awesome part is we've got somebody who has forgotten more about Hawksoft than I will ever know teaching our VPs how to operate. But then when we're done dealing with Peggy, she sends us the call recording all of the static materials that she discussed in there. And so now we're taking the VPs and we're building a SharePoint intranet where we can warehouse all that information. So as we scale and add more outsourced labor, we have an automatic learning management system that we've built along this process and everything's there that they can touch with their fingertips. So I know I just went off on like a random rant for 10 minutes about everything that we're doing, but I mean, it is insane how much of an impact virtual professionals have had on our agency what would you guys say is is some of the you know there's so many questions the agents have so many questions of uh, you know of of the whole uh, virtual professional network what would you say are some of the best practices for taking on a virtual assistant have oh. processes defined i mean have them defined and have them memorialized right so I think everybody needs to know that virtual professionals are not band-aids. Like they can't just come in and, and, and cure the issues that are in your, your agency, you know, they, they need to be taught. So, you know, you may have someone who's got customer service experience or account management experience. It doesn't mean they know your agency's way of doing those things. And I think that where a lot of agencies run into issues with using virtual help, is they don't have the process, you know, formalized and documented so that it's replicable and, tr- and they can train other people on it. It's like walking into my agency. If you would have come in two years ago, it would have been, oh, well, that's just the way David's always done it. You know, talk to David. He can tell you how to do it. Well, you can't do that, man. You can't put in that. You can't can't deal with that uh, situation and not have formalized processes. You've got to have everything lined out so that they know exactly what to do and when, and guess what? The good part is you really only have to show them once. Yeah. Well, I feel like in learning from, uh, from experience, I had, I mean, I mean, starts for me, my advice, start small, take your first three to five tasks of what you need help with in your agency and write those out and write them out in detail. The more detail you have, the less, you know, fewer questions you're going to have to answer going forward. You know, have real them quick. Ma- yeah. yeah. Real quick though, what we've done. So the way we used to do this and what I have talked about, you know, a lot is any, you know, number one, if you're in a, in an agency and you're struggling because you don't think you have enough, support help, you need to look at every task that comes across your desk and say, is this something I need to do? Is this something I need to delegate, which means to somebody in-house, or is this something I can outsource? And if it's delegate or outsource, then you need to make sure you have formalization in your processes. I used to stop or advise my account managers to stop and use Loom and record everything on video to be able to show these people, you know, a video step-by-step-by-step until this year. 
And now we use Tango, which is a Chrome extension. And I can go through and do any web-based task. I have not upgraded to the desktop version yet, but this is a free tool. You can get 25 workflows a month for the free version. And literally, if I'm doing anything else at all or anything at all that's a task on my browser, all I have to do is click the Tango button and start the workflow. And I can go through at my normal speed. When I'm done, I hit stop. And every single time that I click my mouse, Tango captures a screenshot and describes what I just did. So by the time I'm done, I have a PDF that could be 10, 15 pages long of that entire process that I can now upload into SharePoint and label appropriately. The feedback that I've gotten is it's easier for somebody to learn using a static document than it is a video yeah. because with the video, you have to get you know go back and rewind and rewatch or whatever. Whereas if you're just flipping pages, it's really, really easy for you to stay where you're at or get to where you're going. So that has been huge for us. And with being able to do let, let's be realistic here. How many people listening to this podcast right now would do more than 25 workflows a month? They're just not gonna do it. So don't go buy the paid version. Use the free version and prove you need more. And then once you do, you can go upgrade and do it. I mean, eventually at some point. We will upgrade to the paid version that'll do de desktop activities as well. Whether or not that works with the agency management system, I don't know yet. But so much of what we do is web-based. That's really not a big deal. Mm. Does it record video too, David? It does not. It, it's basically going through and it's doing a screenshot every single time. Now, I don't know, maybe you could run Loom and Tango at the same time, right? Maybe you could run Loom to record it, and then Tango is going to create the static image, and you have the ability to generate a video version and a PDF at the same time, and then you can marry those together when you put it into wherever you, you store that stuff. Did you say that you can on Tango, you can make notes on those pages? Yeah, so yeah. It, it, yeah, it does. It'll actually give the description of what you did, but you have the ability to go in and edit that and make it, you know, more descript than what Tango's description is. One of the common questions of, of people thinking about, and I feel like there's far more people that consider taking on a virtual professional than actually do it. And one of the most common questions is, what do you have them do? The truth is the list is so long, you can have them do so many different things. I keep hearing different things. I heard, I was talking to somebody yesterday that says, uh, she has her VA handle some carrier relations. And I mean, so it's uh, reconciling commissions, you know, day-to-day -day tasks, whatever you want to basically, that's probably not client facing, but whatever you want to get off your plate, you can have them do. I, I mean, can I talk about that? Yeah. A, a quick win for anybody that's considering using a virtual professional. I know David does this too, is helping manage your email. I was just on vacation last week and that was my biggest thing. I, I talked to Natasha and Amina, I had them tag team. I said, I want my email to be at zero when I get back. The first day there was about 10 or 15 in there. I said, I want it zero. And they were able to figure it out. They, they responded to certain emails. They forwarded emails, they deleted emails, but what a freeing feeling that is. And that is pretty much any industry. We're all inundated by emails, but to have someone with their eyes on your email constantly so you don't get distracted throughout the day checking your the little pings of your email and not only email that's your your social media your facebook or linkedin or whatever to have them manage that is is a game changer in itself and i want to touch on and we we just kind of glossed over it to me um, so I, I use Savital. I've been I, I, I've been a user for just over a year and I've been very, very impressed, not only with my virtual pro professional, but with the back end team. And so let's touch on the people there. Um, I don't know if they're all college educated, but most of them are. And Troy, you just actually spent some time in Pakistan. So can you touch on your experience there? Everything David said, everything you've said, they're just amazing human beings. And it was it was trip of trip of a lifetime. They're very smart, very, you know, they have great attitudes. They want to work for for this company, Savitel, just because the culture is so great. 
um, whether that be ping pong tables, volleyball, um, just hanging out. There was just, it was just an un unbelievable experience. What I'm actually speaking for the big guy of Minnesota tomorrow. One of the things that I want to bring up is how we're a, a woman, a pro woman biz or company in Pakistan, which we may think in America, you know, I think it, we're pretty much equal rights here in America. Some people may say otherwise, but the difference between America and Pakistan is is very different when it comes to women being able, uh, being able to like work from home if they have a a, a baby or something like that. Um, I think 70% of our employees are women, which is unheard of in Pakistan. We have a, a women's room where the women can go hang out and be by themselves. We um, provide transportation for the women to get into the office in the middle of the night. And um, it's just a really remarkable thing that we're doing over there as far as taking care of women. But in general, it, it was an amazing experience and just very proud to be part of, uh, part of the company. What I would tell you is they have a very infectious culture, right? So you got two different things that you're dealing with, with the virtual professional company. You have the culture of the company itself. Then you have the culture of the businesses where their team members are placed. Savitel, <clears throat> Savitel's mothership places an extreme value on the culture that they have. Everything is team-based. They are very, very um, protective of their team and that culture, and they invest heavily in making sure that it is a desired place for people to work. It blows my mind how many times I see people pinging the LinkedIn page, the Facebook page, all of this stuff, just asking it whether or not they have any jobs, which tells me they're doing something right because so many people are trying to get on board. And it's infectious, man. When you when you watch the social media, when you watch the the recap of the different team, like we just had a an Olympic event for the entire team to celebrate an anniversary and watching I, I got to watch one of my VPs arm wrestling in a women's arm wrestling competition. <laughs> I mean it was just it was absolutely awesome to see because those are the things that we talk about a lot in the United States, but then it never really happens. These people are doubling down on culture and making sure it happens. And it's evidenced in the work product that they put forth in our agencies when we hire them. Well put, Dave. Well, I'd like to add one other thing. Yeah. The managers and the trainers over there, they're all sitting out in the same cubicles as everyone else. They're not off in their offices in the corner, not being part of what's going on on the floor. So we have a culture of anyone can go up to them at any point and talk to them about anything, an open door policy, which is another amazing thing that a lot of times that's in America. It's not as much in Pakistan, but we embrace that. And I think that's why our culture is so good and why we've grown and and gotten bigger and better. Well, I'll tell you, man, I make, I make jokes about it. I literally was in college for eight years. Okay. I, I really <laughs> was. Now, granted, I was working full time at about a hundred hours a week and going to school at night when I was finishing up. But the reason I, I set the table with that is because a lot of people don't know this, but my minor was in Japanese. And the reason it was is because that's where the economy was when I started college. Unfortunately, I was in college so long that it shifted over to China. And so my degree became obsolete in, in Japanese at that in Japanese culture. But I gained a lot of understanding with how you know for how business is done outside of the United States. In in Japan, it's very, very similar to what Savatel has set up with a flat org chart. Nobody's above anybody else. You know, you go over to offices in Japan and everybody, it doesn't matter if you're the CEO of the company or you're it's your first day at work, you are all in the same open office. Everybody is approachable. Everybody can have a, a conversation with whoever they need. We talk about open door policy. Well, that insinuates you're in an office with a door that could be closed. In other countries, they don't have that. It's truly open because there is no door. <laughs> so we need to probably follow a little bit more yeah. of that. That's one. I mean, I will tell you that's how I run my agency right now. I mean, I could probably just take the doors off the hinges because they're never shut anyhow. But I mean, it's more than just a philosophy. And I think that's one of the reasons why working with them is so beneficial to us because there's such an alignment in the core values of how we perceive culture and leading a team. And this, you know, it, it's just fortuitous that we met because 
it's not like I had any influence on that. That existed before I ever even knew who Sabatel was. I, yeah, uh, the back end support for me when when I was checking around for uh, at VA companies, that was a big decision maker in in me going with them. When I was able to um, meet with the back end support, find out how it works on the back end get a feel for what their office culture was like. And it made me feel comfortable from something that was this big unknown. Or I think a lot of us look at uh, uh, virtual assistants as this, you know, distant robotic, you know, environment where work is being done, but that really personalized things for me. And that's carried on um, through now. Um, we have, I probably have, week uh, uh, monthly maybe bi-monthly meetings with my virtual assistance manager and she's outstanding um she's outstanding to just discuss any issues that come up or something that's going on within the company it's um it's really been a good relationship can you uh, touch on kind of the, the general onboarding process when someone takes on a virtual assistant yeah. I can tell you what, yeah, I can tell you what I've just gone through, but I'm going to let Troy talk in more detail. The one thing I would tell everybody is this, you know, relative to our standards in the U S you're going to feel like these people are over communicating with you. I can promise you because they are very, very interested in letting you know what they're doing and then they want feedback on how they did. And so I will tell you, especially during the onboard process, the amount of communication that you get is through the roof. Like there is no way that you can say, hey, nobody ever told me that before, yeah. unless either they really didn't tell you that, you know, or you completely missed it because there's really not much that gets lost in communication. And, you know, we started by having a huddle every day. That comes from my days at Target. You know, we would get together for 10 minutes, do the team stretches, talk about what we wanted to accomplish. And I would do this every single day with my virtual professionals because it's a lot easier for me. Obviously, if I've got six people that I'm managing, I can't deal with six people individually. That would just not, that'd be a non-starter, 100% yeah. for me. But getting them together and being able to talk, A, gives them the opportunity to ask me questions or get information from me, or B, it also helps them realize they're part of something here and it, it fosters more of that team culture of, of us being an extension of Savatel and Pakistan. But as far as the mechanics of it, Troy, talk about, talk about what it's like to onboard. You got it. Well, once we get the AOK -okay from our clients, we, we set up an interview. And if you're just going and getting one virtual professional, um, you would interview three choose the one that you think is going to be the best fit for your organization and your culture. Then we're going to have a um, tech, technology onboarding meeting where we're talking about your VoIP system, your passwords, your management system, all that stuff, getting that dialed in before your VP even starts. In fact, it's usually a, a time of two to three weeks before your VP will start for you. During that time, we encourage our clients to send over um, training videos access to their management system that has training stuff on it just so they can really get ready so they can hit the ground running and as uh, as a part of that and from my experience during that time during that window we discovered okay these are these are the five tasks that we're going to start with right away so there was a back-end support that they were being trained on those things at Savital, um you know by their people for my office which was huge there you go but I want everyone to know out there that it is going to be your training. Like David said, those, those morning huddles, making sure you really incorporate that person like they're a local employee to your company. And you're going to have to do the training. We don't want to overpromise and underdeliver. We're going to get them some basic training on insurance knowledge and stuff. However, there's 100 insurance management systems out there. They're not going to know right. every one of them. Yeah. Um, there's hundreds of carriers out there as well. So um but going back to the technology meeting the onboarding then the, that first meeting that you have we want your vp to, and you to create your first process together because we tell our clients you have to create processes but then that day their client starts or their vp starts their phone's going to be busy like all of us are today 
their you know their emails are going to have all kinds of stuff going on and they may not even have a process ready for their virtual professional to follow so we want to make sure in that first meeting that first onboarding meeting that we create that process a lot of times it's through zoom or loom or something like that but we need to implement tango david so that should be a priority for us i love that um yeah and then you're off to the races you have weekly meetings with the manager at the beginning then we go bi-weekly and then maybe monthly you're getting a report on their tasks as well monthly where we we break down exactly what they do how much they do you'll get a nice pie chart and uh we on top of um meeting with your vp regularly we really want you to meet with their manager whether that be weekly bi-weekly or monthly if you feel it's necessary if not you can cancel those meetings but i think that's super important because we have had situations where after three months someone's not happy and they've missed all the check-ins with their manager and they're not really communicating with their virtual professional so that's not good for anyone i mean you can't just throw money on it at it and expect them to no. succeed without your training and input some of the drawback that i've heard is that uh you know, this guy didn't, you know, this virtual assistant didn't know anything. Um, you know, they said they were trained. I, I don't I don't know who necessarily believes that. Yeah, the more you put in, it's just like any staff, any unlicensed staff you bring into your office, you have to train them. You have to train them everything. Or licensed. Them, uh, correct. You can bring in someone from State Farm for 20 years and they're not going to yeah. know what to do. That yeah, first lear day in your, yeah, learn in your that the year. hard way. I think the other thing that's important too, as part of this process is the agency needs to get whoever's going to be your liaison, whether it's the agency principal or you have an operations person that's going to be responsible for communicating with your VPs. Every morning we get an email. Every afternoon I get an email and says, hey, here's good morning. Here's what I'm getting ready to start doing today. And at the end, here's what I accomplished today take the 10 seconds to reply back to those emails. Mm. You know, I'm the worst about it and I get six of them now. So it makes it even more, you know, more difficult for me to do it. But I didn't realize how much it meant to them when you respond back yeah. every single time. And I'm not saying you need to go back and write, you know, the Gettysburg address it, it, to respond to them, but just give them a quick couple sentences like, Oh, great job today. Or man, can't wait to look and see, can't wait to see it when it's done or whatever else. It just lets them know that you're checked in and invested into the process. And in the grand scheme of things, if it takes me 10 seconds to reply to six emails, that's 60 seconds out of my day, one minute. Am I really too busy to take a minute to let people know how much I appreciate them? Absolutely not. It's a crap excuse. It just means my priorities are out of whack when I don't do it. So I would advise everybody, if you're going to go down this road, regardless of what company you use, give your people some feedback. If that's too much to ask and you don't like doing it, it might be a reason why you need VAs because you don't have help that sticks around. Yeah. Amen. And David, you're an anomaly in a lot of respects because you do do things better than me. When you, you were talking about that, I have a new guy, Hussein, who's just started with us transitioning in for Bilal. And he's been sending me those emails over the last week. I haven't responded to one of them. So I just went in there I'm like... Well, no, and let me be clear, man. I am not the post. Yeah, I'm not the poster child for this because there are days that I don't that I forget or that I don't get to it. And so I just I'm all I'm saying is this is my public service announcement. It's really important to these people. You give them feedback. Do it. Yeah. 100%. Sometimes that even means more than a hundred dollar tip, right? Give them that. How much is a hundred bucks though? Really? Like to any of the three of us that are on here and quite frankly, to any of you out there listening to this, is a hundred dollars really going to, you know, make us lose our house for the month? Probably not. So I can tell you one of the ways that I ha have intentionally, <clears throat> I do this for my team here, but I've also done it for my virtual professionals. When somebody comes on board with Florida risk at the end of their first week, we deposit a hundred dollars mm -hmm. into their account because I want them to take their family out to celebrate their first week of being on our team. It nice. blows me away. The response that I get, I mean, it makes me feel so good. I just want to start making it rain with hundred dollar bills <laughs> in Pakistan and just let them, let them, keep them you know, that. I'd like to see you know, that reaching out. But I mean, I, I think it's really, again, it's exactly the same thing we do here, man. When somebody comes and starts to work, I want their first day to have all their technology set up. I want them to know what the expectations are. I want them to feel 
hundred percent welcome. And we have a process that we run people through. And at the end of that week, I want them to take their, their significant other out, go to a nice dinner, get a nice bottle of wine, relax, talk about your week and just know that you're appreciated. That's yeah. it. And okay. I want them to be able to be the same. I don't view those people any differently than I view my domestic staff at all. A lot of the reluctance that I read or hear about is, uh, I think is generated just from the distance or, you know, in a different country. And I think Savital has done something that is very unique and, and, and that is partner with Cyberfin. So David, can you touch on what Cyberfin is and, and what that does, um, for people that are, that are looking for a virtual assistant? Well, I can, I can tell you from firsthand experience, it gives people like me that are risk managers to try and poke a hole in every single thing that could go wrong in any operation, a little bit of peace of mind, right? And, and Troy can tell you this because, you know, we have some relatively significant um, processes we're going through. I'm trying to think of the right word. Um, processes we're going through right now um, through no fault of Savital whatsoever. But my agency, in, in my book personally, one of the classes of business that I write and have a, a, a pretty good amount of is Department of Defense contractors for the U.S. military and other militaries across the world. But imagine what their expectations are for cybersecurity, right? And so we're at a point now where our, US, our, our DOD contractors are getting audited, but it doesn't stop with them. The people that are vendors or suppliers to those contractors are also getting audited. And part of that process is Florida Risk Partners has to answer and go through cybersecurity assessments to make sure that we have our stuff at a level where we're able to continue to represent our clients that are in the DO, that are DOD contractors, because for obvious reasons, they don't, they don't want to get hacked or have any any issues. And so for the last couple of weeks, we've been going, you know, really, really deep down this rabbit hole, specifically with Savitel in Pakistan to make sure that my managed services provider and, you know, the people that we're going through these DOD audits with, and now um, we have a cyber attorney involved to make sure that we've done our due diligence and that we have a, a risk audit to show that, yeah, I mean, this is not an issue with this company. They've done the things they need to do to be able to work effectively with the absolute minimum risk possible from a cyber event standpoint. And having a company like Cyberfin that's on their end of that of, of the spectrum that are you know looking at things like endpoint detection resolution and all of the other stuff that goes into it, that's a big deal. In addition to that, there's biometric security features to get into the service room. There are wireless cameras that are up to make sure that people can't get into unauthorized areas of the building, keypad access, all of this stuff. So all of you conspiracy theorists out there that are concerned about whether or not the, the company is able to perform and do so in a safe manner, they've literally taken every precaution known to man that they could possibly take to make that the safest environment possible. And if you're not happy with that level, then I need to come visit your agency because you obviously have way more in place than what the average people on the streets do. Without a doubt, it's 10 times more secure than my office. Without a doubt. <laughs> I'm sure. I mean, who, who, who couldn't say that? I mean, I, I'm not going to sit here and say that because I don't have a choice, right? right? I'm in a position where I have, I mean, like. It's it's really inconvenient. I hate dual factor authentication. It is going to cost me an iPhone at some point because there's going to be a time <laughs> that I need to get onto a device and I have to use my dual factor and I'm going to get pissed and I'm going to throw it like a frisbee across the room and it's going to be done. Right. So I I can't st I understand the need for cybersecurity. That doesn't mean I like it or it makes my life more convenient because it doesn't. But here's what I've come to realize. The more inconvenient it is, the safer my stuff is. And I'm willing to just suck it up and deal with it. And, you know, again, my IT, the, one of the nice parts about all of this is my managed services provider deals directly with the IT people at Savital. We built very specific remote desktop connections into my agency so that we didn't have to worry about you know, how people would be able to get access to our data, number one, but also by extension, the data center where our local instance of Hawksoft is is hosted, right? That's the first piece. And so, 
you know, we've done all of those things to make sure that, you know, we're able to satisfy anybody and everybody who's going to be way more thorough in researching, you know, what's going on in our operations than any of the three of us that are chatting right now, I can promise you. Yeah. Another thing that I, I've I've noticed is, you know, it's not just the backend support that Savitel is providing. It's, you know, some of these other services like the appointment setting. Um, David's using the appointment setting and, and I'm not sure some of the other features is there also some marketing support that's available too. Can you touch on that? Well, I can tell you, yeah, they'll, they'll do anything you need them to do as long as you have a way to teach them. So I'll give you an example. Um, you know, it's not a secret. I put out a ton of video content. I don't personally edit that stuff anymore. I used to way back when, and then I passed that off to my oldest son, but Grayson's now at a point where mm -hmm. he is finished up with his pre-licensing coursework. And in the next couple of weeks, he'll be licensed and out on the streets producing. And so in order for us to backfill, we needed to figure out a way to do that. Well, one thing we did was train my middle son, Landon, but he can't work until he gets out of school. So it left us upside down with having more work than, than what we could process. And so we just decided we would push this out to, to virtual professionals. But I didn't just say, hey, by the way, go do this. You know, I went out and invested and bought a video editing course for them. You know, it, it cost me $1,000. Yeah, that was a, a bigger check than 100 to write. But for 1000 bucks, I bought a lifetime membership to this course. Now, every time I want to bring another person in, I can run them through the exact same mm -hmm. course at no additional cost, and they're going to be trained on it. Same reason we use Total CSR. Every single one of my Savitel VPs is going through every module mm -hmm. that I assigned to them on Total CSR. And when you marry that to the training they're getting from Peggy Corbett, they're going to be absolutely deadly in another month or two, right? It didn't happen in a week. It's still not done. In some cases, I've had two of these ladies that have been with me since February 1st, but I understood going in, I needed to have the patience to let them learn the jobs. And so my thing is this, if it's something that you need in your agency and it's something that you're already doing and something you can document anybody over there that they have on the bench can come in and learn those tasks into them. That's the thing, man. Having an appointment setter is nothing more than having somebody that doesn't have a fear to pick up the phone and dial the phone 150, 200 times in a day. We make excuses on that stuff over here. These people don't care. They understand that if they don't get to yes on this call, it's just getting them closer to it. And they make their next call, their next call, their next call. But I know people who use them for accounting and commission reconciliation, like you said, general data entry. Canva, you know, we have one of the young ladies that we taught how to, you know, enhance her Canva skills. And she does a ton of graphics that way. And I mean, all of this stuff adds up, man. If I mean, I know that we want to go to Fiverr and, and buy this stuff. But if you start running a tab on how much you're spending on Fiverr every month and what you get for that and how long you have to mm. wait to get it versus bringing somebody in house. It's a no brainer, man. It, it, you're going to spend less money and you're going to end up making more because your marketing stuff is going to be more cohesive and how quickly it gets out and gets distributed. And that doesn't even count teaching them how to distribute your social content, schedule posts, how to upload blogs, optimize for SEO, all of that stuff, man. It, it's amazing. So, I mean, I don't, Troy, I mean, you can talk about even more things, I'm sure. sure. Yeah. Uh, one thing we have them do in, in my agency too is simply answering the phones. They take away 60% of the phone calls from my local team. And just like my emails, they're able to forward the correct phone calls to the correct people. We, we use the service centers for a good percentage of our companies. They're able to you know weed out the telemarketers so nobody gets bothered by them. And um, yeah, our team is able to focus on more of the, the proactive phone calls and work in the agency. So on top of that, Google reviews is another qu quick thing that they do for us. They not only help get the Google reviews, they answer the Google reviews. They put them in Canva. They promote them on all our social media, and that's daily. So, yeah, um, phone calls, social, everything David said. I mean, they, they, they'll do – the, what David said that really hit home to me was he's got patience. He's willing to invest his money and understand that they're not going to day one going to be able to dominate on a, a certain task. Like he's putting them through total CSR and it's cool seeing them on social media. They're very proud of what 
you know, when they get through the yeah, they're posting their completion, their certificates of completion, and and all of that stuff, man. I mean, mm-hmm. it's it's really cool. How many how many people in the U.S. do you see that are account managers or CSRs that put that certificate up? You know, you know, doing a, a, a humble brag about the fact they just completed. You don't ever see that. I didn't even know those certificates existed. You know, <laughs> until why? until they started putting them up. Ninety five percent of the people out there have not gotten through the course, so they didn't even know. Yeah, well, that's possible too. But I mean, I, I think it's this, man. If you're sitting in your agency and, and there's thing, there are things that you want to get done, but you constantly find yourself saying, I just don't have time. I just don't have time. I just don't have time. Well, if you've got the money, hire it out, right? You're going to have to slow down to speed up at some point in your operation. But the reason I'm patient, Troy, is because I see forward progress. It's not that I'm just putting them into a situation and they're sitting there floundering, treading water, not making forward progress is every piece of video editing that we've gotten back 100% up to my standards. No, originally none of them were, but then it got to be 25%. We're ready to go. Then 50, then 75. And we're still working to a hundred, but you know what? They've gotten so much better that the things that, that we point out, are so minute at this point. I'm the one who knows because it's a matter of personal preference, but even Grayson was telling me yesterday, I was being too nitpicky about some of the things that I was pointing out. I want them to be the best they can be right. I'm never going to let up. So, you know, they, they, and, and I think that my team pretty much understands that at this point, but point being the patience comes from the fact that we are making forward progress. And I know, I know this, I know that if I were going to go out and try and find somebody in, you know, in my local community to try and train from the ground up, the amount of money I would have to spend to bring them in is much higher than what it costs for me to get a virtual professional. The work ethic is nowhere near as good. The work product is typically nowhere near as good. And the reliability is nowhere near as good. So why in the world would I invest a higher salary to get less than what I could spend, invest in somebody, albeit it might take them three months to get up to speed, but I'll be so bold as to say that in three months of time of me working with these people and them going through our process, I'd put them up against anybody else's account managers they've hired off the streets. I'm that confident in how much we've invested. Well, bottom line, and if you didn't see the potential and if you didn't see the progress, you wouldn't be, you wouldn't have six of them. No. And I mean, let me tell you why I have six of them because I always get on there to interview one. And I like two of the three that I interview. So I end up hiring two instead of one. And it's funny because I saw somebody else say the same thing in, in the team's thread this last week. Uh, I don't remember who it was. It was actually somebody I know, but I remember them saying, Hey, so-and-so jumped on and, and, and bought a VP, but they bought, ended up getting two. Cause they like, they like them so much and I'm guilty of that. I mean, I could not, I'm, I'm of the mindset and always have been hire before you need hire before yeah. you need somebody. Right. And if you're using virtual professionals, it's the easiest way for you to hire before you need somebody, because if you have everything documented and you've got a good and proven training process for them, it's, it's not difficult for you to just go, I mean, it's almost like an endless supply of labor, to be honest with you, yeah. for the most part. You could just say, okay, I need another person. I need another person. I mean, we're actually bringing in a, I've got Jeremy that just got licensed, Grayson that will be licensed, but on May 1st, I'm adding a second appointment setter, man. We are we are going to bury the throttle in this bitch this year. I can tell you. It's gonna, <laughs> it, you know, yes, sir. It, we're going to a completely different level, and it's 100% because we have this partnership yeah. with Savitel. Yeah. Woo. Yeah. Yeah. Fellas, hey, that's a, that's a, that's a great note. Um, I want to be respectful of you guys' time. Anything we didn't cover today? Anything, Troy? Anything else you want to get out there? Well, a couple things. I wanted to talk about what David's got going on really quick. And the reason I know David is from his podcast. I know, Brad, you're starting your podcast out. And you're close to catching up with the amount of listeners as David. We're not quite there yet. Does he have more than 12? I mean, <laughs> don't quit, man. Listen, true story, true story. Bradley Flowers and Scott Howell are two of my best friends on the face of the earth at this point. And um, when I started Power Producers due to COVID, 
Scott told me, don't stop until you get 50 episodes. Don't look at your downloads. Don't worry about it. Do 50 episodes and then decide what you're going to do. Bradley told me that month number one for the Insurance Guys podcast, they got eight downloads. Eight in month number one. And now they've blown up. They have a massive podcast. They do really, really well. So don't let Troy throw shade at you, Brad. <laughs> 50, 50, oh, 50 episodes and keep doing it. You're not yeah. doing it for the downloads. You're doing it to make a difference. And that only takes one download. To that's right. Yeah. Yeah. That's kind of yeah. what I wanted to talk about a little bit, a little motivation from, from David, a little advice. And he, that sounds, sounds about right to me. Just keep going. You wanted to touch on some of the things he was doing. I think Troy. Is that well, where you're going? You do have so many businesses and stuff, and you're going to NOLA here next week to speak. Um, do you mind sharing with us what, what that's about? Yeah, Other no, than I mean, ball again? Yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, it's um, I've developed a pretty good relationship with Keystone Insurers Group, and this is their annual conference for sales strategies and emerging leaders. Um, I was blessed with the opportunity to be able to go out and speak at their conference in Vegas last year. Apparently, they liked what they heard, so they invited me to come back again this year. So I'm going to be there. Um, this is my brutal travel time, man. They get it, We're off to the races now. So I'm at Keystone Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, fly out Wednesday afternoon to speak for the Big Eye of Illinois on uh, Thursday. And then I, I'll be back home. Friday morning next week. And then I, I turn around in a couple weeks after that and run the same thing up to Minneapolis, man. I'm flying in and I'm going to speak for your group up there at, um, in Wisconsin. And then um, I, I leave there and I fly over to Salt Lake City and then fly back Friday morning. Wow. So it's, um, you know, I will tell you this, man, this is my last hurrah. I'm done after this. It's not fair to my family. I don't like being gone. Um, I, you know, when, when you, uh, when you publish, when you publish a book, when you have the podcast, when you have these things, people want to hear from you. I think one of the issues that we run into, especially in our industry, is too many people hog the limelight. and They, des they desire that. They want to be in front of everybody. And I certainly am somebody who has no problem sharing my message. But I don't I also don't need to get all the recognition. I don't need to be on the main stage, you know, you know, talking about how great I am and all the things that I'm doing. I'm not into that, you know. For the, the, I went out and spoke over the course of the last year and a half at the rate that I have because I had you know a book that had just released originally and now I've written a second one that had released. And it was really just to go promote that and be able to go out and network and meet with people. And here's what I'm going to tell you. If you're an agent and you have that opportunity, take it because I can't tell you the invaluable relationships that I've been able to make just by going to these different events. And here's the other thing. Don't don't put too much value on yourself, okay? One of the things I pride myself on when I go and speak in an event like Keystone or Big Eye, Illinois, or Young Agents of North Carolina or any of these places that I've been, it's I ha actually had a gentleman from Big Eye, Michigan call me this morning out of the blue to talk about maybe doing something with them. And I told him the same thing. I live in Tampa, Florida. You're in Benton, Michigan. When I'm there, you have me, period. And I invest heavily in that conference. I, I don't just speak and leave. I don't just speak and go hide in my room. I make sure that I go to all of the social activities, that I'm shaking hands and kissing babies as much as I can. And here's what I found from that. There's a lot of value in building those relationships yeah. because I get referrals from all over the country. Anytime somebody knows somebody's coming to Florida, open a business or has a business and they're not getting treated right or they're moving there and they need help with personal lines. I'm always at the front of people's minds because I put so much content out and don't ask for anything in return. And so I think that if you do the things that you the, the, the types of things that I do and you do it with your heart in the right place it manifests itself in a way that's going to pour out a blessing on you bigger than anything you can possibly imagine. So just keep your perspective right, man. That's the one thing I would say. Yeah, my fingers are in a lot of things, but my message that I would get to anybody is I'm no different than any of you, not, not any single one. And it, it's always refreshing for me to hear. We were in New Orleans last week for Jason Cass's brain share. And we had a, a couple of new people in Killing Commercial that, that were hanging out with us the one night. And the one guy looked across the table at me and he said, I just wanted to thank you. He said, you're exactly who you said you would be. That's so true. And that's it. Troy's been to my house. You know, we've hung out before, uh, you know, professionally, both personally, everything. And For the record, he wasn't really invited to your house. Though, right? he just he's, lucky he he's lucky he didn't get shot. Okay. 
Let's just call it what it is. But I think that Troy can tell you it doesn't matter what environment I'm in. No. I'm no different. And I mean, one of the things I do in Killing Commercial is I record the Zoom calls that I have as new business meetings. And even then, people will be like, you're the exact same guy when you're yeah, talking really. to somebody about a million dollars in premium as you are when you're just sitting around the table having lunch with us. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a problem in our industry, man. People start getting a little, little visibility. There's there's this thing that people you know, have called being insurance famous and they let it go to their head. Don't do that. Yeah. Don't don't forget what let you get that platform. Then be that person consistently and you'll retain it. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. Well said. All right, fellas, I'm going to get this thing wrapped up. Uh, thank you so much for your time. Oh, before I do that, uh, uh, Troy, in case anybody wants to get in touch with you, wants to learn more about Savital, how can they get a hold of you? Well, you can Google Savital. That's pretty easy. S-A-V-V-I-T-A-L. Um, you can call my cell, 612-408-9000. And LinkedIn, how, however you want to reach out. We're here for you. David, what's the best way to get in touch with you if someone wants to reach out? They can they can hit me up on email, uh, David at FloridaRiskPartners.com. Um, that's probably the best way. But people, I want to say one more thing as we close up. Savital is the morphing of two words. It's savvy and vital. You know, the operations that are vital to your agency are things that you can't turn a blind eye to. And in the hard market and the time times that we're in right now, we have to be savvy. We have to be savvy business owners to make sure that the vital tasks are done so that we can scale our operations. So if you're ready to be savvy on those vital tasks, come get savvy and reach out to Troy. Yes. Right here. Love it. That's Love David's, it. David's uh, catchphrase as well. Hashtag get savvy, baby. Mic drop. <laughs> Thank you everyone for listening to another episode of the Agents to Owners podcast. And we'll see you next week. All right. Thanks, Brad.